God gives us the opportunity to be able to spend time face to face. I've been praying and hoping. Initially, I was praying for it to happen. We're talking about early this year, and then God moved it further, and October is God's good time for this. Amen. Amen. No problem, brother. So, um, yeah, I I heard about the series uh, that you guys have been doing from the Heritage Day, right? Was that 24, 25th September? All of those two. Yeah. End of September. Yeah, Yeah, end of September. And uh, from that moment on, uh, I heard about, you know, he he briefed me on on the series. So I'm really glad to key into it. It's definitely an era of passion that we have in common. Uh, You can't be afraid of Michael Burns and not be carried along (laughs) on topics like this. But also, like uh, Neil did share, I've been privileged to live in different cultures. And we, we did talk a bit about that online. We did some of the sessions we had online. But um, for a young African from West Africa, I was born in Cameroon. My mom is from Nigeria, but I only moved to Nigeria 12 years ago. Uh, my wife took me there. Uh, she's from there. And so, but having studied in Germany, and this is Germany of 30 years ago, um, just coming out of the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? Uh, there was a huge difference between East and West Berlin. A huge difference. Over the years, the gap is beginning to close up, but still you could feel, I mean, you just need to drive from West Berlin to East Berlin and you're in a different world. Is it architecture? Is it so many differences? The kind of cars that people drive, there's just so much that reminds you of the Eastern Bloc. So moving from, from where I was born to, 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 to Germany, and I became a disciple under challenging circumstances with cancer, surviving that, like I alluded to. In fact, two weeks ago, 1st of October, I turned exactly 30, but I was, I met, I was met in hospital by one of my doctors who was treating me of cancer of the bone marrow, of the kidney, and of the liver. So how do you survive those three, right? So um, God has been incredibly kind to me. Um, I was met through one of my doctors in hospital. And I was just sitting there, I was thinking, that Neil actually reminds me a lot of Dr. Michael. Uh, There's going to be some connection there. (laughs) So uh, I'm great for the exposure to different cultures. From there, I moved to French-speaking Africa, where I served the church between Côte d'Ivoire, Abidjan, Ivory Coast, is a, but, but they like it Côte d'Ivoire. They changed the name from Ivory Coast to the French version, Côte d'Ivoire. Um, so served, served between Côte d'Ivoire and Cameroon for 13 years in total. Um, and then decided to go back and pursue my education, which I had stopped. But this time in social science and no more technical. Interestingly, when I was done with that, I got a job in the technical. In the, in, <laughs> in the telecom industry, IT industry, and it was really beautiful to connect the two worlds, the people skills and the technical skills. I sat right there in the middle, connecting the project managers and doing all the technical stuff with the business top management people. I could speak both languages to an extent, and so I became like a a middleman. Uh, But it it was a lot of fun. But I'm I'm just sharing here to say, uh, it's such a privilege that we get to be part of a family that connects so many cultures. I know even in Germany, there were times when, when I look at a, a picture that, that was taken by, by a, you know, of us, a group of disciples, it's only when I look at the picture that I realize I seem to be the only black guy in this picture. <laughs> but I often didn't think about it. I often didn't feel like I'm some odd person in the group. That, in fact, if anything, I felt like I was loved even more. <laughs> and so it, it was an incredible experience. So till date, I'm very connected to the churches there. In fact, they uh, mainly support my travels. Uh, it, it's to that extent that we've remained connected. Uh, and so it's just an incredible blessing that we talk about a topic like this. Gathering of the nations is not theory for us. When we went to that conference the teacher's conference, it was quite unique because I think we had three days in that conference, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But on Friday, none of the ICOC teachers taught any class at all. All they did was 
introduced teachers from the mainstream Church of Christ. I didn't say mainline, right? <laughs> and teachers from the, uh, is it Christian Church? Uh, we, we all share the same uh, 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 beliefs when it comes to things like salvation. And so the first day of that conference, they were asked to share about what they think about us, ICOC. And I just remember that every one of them, they were, they were very generous, very kind, very um, honest. But every speaker that came up always talked about the fact that they marvel at how multiracial we are. It's almost like, what's your secret? Have you been able to achieve this? Because within their own churches, you will find the white church, you will find the black church, the white go to the white branch, and the black go to the black, Hispanic and all kinds, or social class, people of a certain class go to this branch. And that happens in many other, uh, in the Christendom. I used to be a Catholic. I used to see some of that, some of, some of the, 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 they would call it the diocese. So the diocese is upper class, uh, you know. But they're like, how did you guys achieve this multiracial? We had in the church in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, people of, even in Lagos, people of incredible uh, social standing. But if they don't mention it or somebody may, you will have no clue. Because in the fellowship, they are the simplest people. I remember one who used to work in the ADB Bank. He's a professor in sociology and just a very educated. You come to church, he's a guy in front dancing and sweating and you have just no clue. And so I, most of those teachers were like, how did you guys achieve this? And so we're talking about something that is not theoretical for our family of churches. Uh, and I think their message was, what you guys have is so precious, you got to keep it. Make sure you don't lose it. Make sure you continue to grow, build on that strength. And so I just felt like making those initial uh, first comments as we move into the rest of the class. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, of course, this, one, this is a, a slide I got from Neil. Uh, you guys have already covered... This is the, the, the point. Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, you guys have already covered Rome. I think you started with Antioch. Yeah, Antioch. Yeah. And then yeah, Ephesus, Rome. Rome. Uh, these are the three. So today's part four. Yeah. Exactly. So today we're covering... We're going to be covering Corinth today. So that's what we're covering today. Lessons from Corinth. A bit of background, uh, and of course, these dates uh, uh, actually just show Paul's travels and when he got to these places to plant churches. That's what these dates are, um, the spread of Christianity. I just dug up this map because um, it just gives a bit more of the geography of Corinth. And what we have on the right there, Ethmus of Corinth. Uh, and then you realize that you have the Gulf of Corinth on that side. I want to talk about the fact that Corinth was such a cosmopolitan city. Um, they had a, a very renowned uh, seaport. Lots of uh, uh, sailors and travelers and tourists who flock into, 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 into Corinth. Paul spent 18 months there. But prior to that, he had been in Athens. And Athens was a challenging missionary field to Paul, to Paul. And maybe he just thought, hey, let me move to Corinth. He was a tent maker. And in a city like that, with lots of tourists and sailors, he probably found a good place not only to practice his trade as a tent maker, but spent some time building tents, making tents, and also sharing the gospel with people. Um, so this is just a bit of the geography. And I, I feel very connected to this map because I had the opportunity nine years ago, can't believe time goes, flies uh, this picture was taken. I took this picture, and uh, and this picture simply shows where you have current there, current from 1858 from the Gulf of of Corinth. So this picture is that 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 same place. You got the picture that this is how it looks today, and and, and I took this picture because we visited Corinth on a Bible study tour, and we went up what you call the Acro Corinth, which I think is on that map. Yeah, Acro Corinth. You can see right here, right? 
Okay, so you have Acropolis, which is in Athens, which is where you have you used to worship Parthenon, the goddess uh, Athena, and then in Corinth you have the Acro Corinth, which is like the highest place of the city, and there they had temples built to worship a goddess of of sex or fertility, and and that explains why it was such an immoral city. Um, so there's a bit more about that which we might see. So that's a picture from up there. That's me. And this picture here, you can see water there, right? Now, the water actually is what connects this part of the, there to this part. So the, that, they had to build a canal where vessels could come from the Aegean Sea and move into the port of Corinth. And I think the map also shows that. There it is. That's a canal. So this picture was taken somewhere there or there. I don't remember exactly which one. We were coming from Athens. Where is Athens? Not on this map. So we're coming from Athens and we're basically crossing that canal. A man-made canal. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. And these are pictures. You can see Jacoby there with his hat. And you can see Dr. Steve Kennard on the further left, also wearing a hat. And disciples from all... I think we're, we're... I think we're, we're, we're 85 of us from 17 nations on that trip. And I happened to be the only one representing our continent. It was a privilege. Um, so that's the Itmus connecting those two bodies of water that we just saw on the map. So important uh, city port, city uh, uh, as, as current, and these ships coming and going through the canal to be able to go deliver goods in the Gulf of Corinth. Um, how do I play this? Let me see. Oh, that, 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 that works. Okay. This is a dream come true. I'm standing right here. This altitude is the town, the city of Corinth, where Paul spent 18 months uh, planting a church that impacted the entire region. We can see uh, the water, the seaport. Um, it's obvious that the inside. A real, uh, you know, hub, commerce, economics, and Paul stayed here and did a great work for 18 months. It's a dream to be here. And I said the same thing in German. So I, there was a lot of noise, a lot of fellowship around. So, but that was a short video I just found in my archives uh, this afternoon. So from the city down here, you can. That's where we took the video up there, the hill up there, and we and we did walk to get up there. So going on those tours, fitness is one of the conditions. <laughs> where we drove to the to the bottom of the, and then we had to climb up. Hey. So this is like, the, like the, the, uh, the city center of ancient Corinth on the left, and then you can see the Acro Corinth from a distance. And so those temples were built up there, where they used to have thousands of prostitutes, I mean, intense worship, where they are practicing sex in their worship. Okay, the Aphrodite, um, yeah, exactly, the Aphrodite goddess of love was worshipped on those temples built on top of the Acro Corinth. I think I even have, yeah, these are the remains of those ancient temples where they used to worship. So this was taken right up there on top of the hill. But you can see rocks, right? This is rocks. These are rocks, some of the remains of those temples. And from up here, you can see the, the landscape from, from a distance. So just a bit of live pictures to say these places exist. Uh, the beauty, uh, somebody has called visiting places like this the fifth gospel. There's something it does to your faith when what you've been reading for years, you're able to now go visit and connect with the geography, with the culture, and you're like, wait a minute, our faith is not a myth. Our faith is true and reasonable, like Paul would say. And uh, so Corinth, I mean, that explains why in the book of Corinth you find all kinds of immorality and all kinds of stuff dealt with because from the nature of the city, the proverbial nature of the city, it, was, it had that background with temple worship and, and, and very intense practices. Okay, so that's a bit of the background uh, of the book. And so I did mention that Paul came here from Athens and settled there for uh, 18 months. What I'd like to highlight is just how um, Paul just had an incredible love for the, for, for the churches. And he spent 18 months here. 
But all of his letters, all the epistles, really just show how much, yeah, just how much heart he had for, for the church. In fact, in the case of Corinth, it is believed that even though we have in the Bible, we do have two letters, Corinthians, right? But it's believed there are at least four. Because in the first letter, he talks about the report from uh, Chloe's family that gave report of some of the things that are happening in the church. So he had received a first letter. So what we call First Corinthians actually is possibly Second Corinthians. And in Second Corinthians, he refers to another letter that they received. And he said, uh, even though they were sad, he rejoices because that sadness led them to repentance. So there's another letter in between the first and the second, according to the Bible, which is actually, in reality, the, the first is actually the second, and the second is actually the fourth of the letters. Okay, Just interesting detail right there. But for him to spend 18 months in one place, the, the only longer stay he had in another city was Ephesus, where he spent a total of three years, maybe broken into two periods of a year almost, and another two years, or maybe six months, and two and a half. But a total of about three years that he spent in Ephesus. But he spent that long in Corinth, and had a passion for the church to the point of writing so many letters. So Paul is not just known for planting churches. Uh, this was during his second missionary journey. In Acts 18, you'll find the full story of that, Paul in Corinth. But he had a heart. He had the shepherd's heart. I want, I want us to read. Um, yeah. So in the beginning of the book, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, spiritual gifts. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I underline a few things there. All of Paul's letters are so Christ-focused. I mean, I did a class on Sunday in the northwest region of Joburg on a Christ-centered life. And Paul just I was having a conversation with a friend. He's part of Rocky Mountain, uh, Ubert A.K. And he was telling me, you know what I think? I think Paul was possessed by Christ. He was so consumed. So in his letters, Christ just comes up again and again. Uh, Or if you go to Ephesians, you go to Colossians, the expression in him just comes up almost everywhere. He had such a, a focus on Christ. And that actually plays out later in the second part of the letter. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's a challenging one. In mind and thought. My brothers, some, of, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you and that." That reference to that first letter, okay, he had gotten that report to his family. What I mean is this one of you say, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say, that you were baptized into my name. So division, there is division, there is the spirit of, you know, people, almost like sex are building up within the church community, a sectarian spirit of following messenger, the messenger instead of following the message. And so he's addressing that, but to address that, he has started the letter by just being so Christ-centered. In the first few verses we saw, He does that even better and even more in a book like Colossians, where he talks about the supremacy of Christ, and then goes on to apply that Christ-centeredness to different aspects of life. So right now in Corinthians, he basically addresses division in the first four chapters, then addresses 
the sexuality, the immorality issues in the next following chapters. And then food was an issue uh, uh, offered to idols, all kinds of stuff. And then the later part, it talks about uh, gatherings or the church as a, as a, as a gathering. So he, 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 he uses the gospel uh, about Jesus and applies the gospel in addressing different needs. That, that's something that Paul was a master at. Uh, at using the unchanging message of the gospel to address the ever-changing needs of the church. So you find Paul doing a lot of that. So what we just read earlier on, he's addressing this sectarian spirit that, had, that existed. So some were following Apollos. We know Apollos as someone that was very knowledgeable, right? So because of his intellectual presentation of the gospel, he was very polished, very eloquent. So I can imagine that people like students, for example, will love an Apollos. People are very studious. Okay? I see my sister smiling. All right. Are you students? All right. So I, 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 I touched some. Uh, she resonated. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So that group of people will love an eloquent speaker like Apollos. Peter was the fisherman. He was the Jew. So Judaizers, the guys who advocated that you must be circumcised, for example, in order to be saved, the typical staunch Jews would tend to want to follow a Peter because that's their background. Whereas uh, people who are into freedom in Christ, okay, who, who are you know, more on the, on the free side, um, would tend to want to like Paul. For somebody who had gone from being a Pharisee of Pharisees, Hebrew of Hebrews, obeying the law, and then here he is preaching freedom in, in Christ. They're like, that's the guy we want. You know? So depending on where people are coming from, they tended towards following different personalities. Let me ask an interactive question. Is it different today? What we see happening in Corinth? Okay, it's not different today. Can we say a bit more to that? I like, I like making it interactive. Why do you think it's not different today? Okay, choosing the church based on who is the preacher. Absolutely. So, like, just a, a further comment to that. Like, back in Nigeria, and I'm sure you guys have it here. Um, oh, we have all these mega churches. Oh, boy. In, in our neighborhood, we have one mega church. I mean, you go to the auditorium, it is so impressive. I've not walked in, but I've seen pictures online, but we live not far, we drive round it, we drive past it. Even from outside, it's so impressive. And, and so we have lots of that, and the message there, I believe, can improve your social status. Which is nothing bad, right? But the only problem is that it is void of the core gospel message. So I often tell my wife, that I don't call them churches. I call them human resource centers. <laughs> there is good in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is a lot of good in it. All right. Well, that was my comment right there. Your hand was up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's also just because we tend to want to follow what makes us most comfortable. That's a great point there. Yeah. Our comfort zone, right? Exactly. What are be the, the kind of people you want to hang out with? Especially like what I just described. People go there to make connections, business connections. Because you go there, you meet some top decision makers. And so you want to rub, you know, shoulders with those people, get their contacts, you know. So, so it improves your life, your social life. Yeah, but it's called a church, you know. So, yeah. What makes us comfortable? All right. Any other comments about why we think it's not so different today? I think it's uh, familiar reality. <laughs> when people are familiar with the, the culture and the church itself, they don't want to see others, other churches and like, branch out. So they're like, I'm here. This is, this is my people. That's, that's, that's a very interesting one. 
I, I, I like that because I'm experiencing that in my family. Well, we're from a very Catholic background, and uh, for, I, I believe for me to even become a disciple, I needed to leave home and go away from home. I, was, I, was, uh, I left home when I was 19. No, I left home 18 for university in another city. Uh, so I was alone for a year, away from dad and mom and siblings for a year within the same country. Another city, but I gained some level of independence during that time. And then got a scholarship to go study in Europe, Germany, far away. And it gave me time. To, and so when I, when I fell sick and I, was, I had cancer, I really had time to wrestle with. I've been going to church my whole life, but now I'm dealing with cancer. Why would God allow me to die at the age of 19, eight, uh, 20? And, and I started wrestling with those things. And so... What I, the faith I thought I had, because I would tell people I'm a Christian because I go to church, but now my faith was tested, and I realized I really didn't have that much faith, and I started seeking. But I really think it helped me that I was away from home. If I was at home, the pressure I would have gone through, even from a distance, I went through some serious pressure, because that, that belonging in our church back then as a Catholic meant you don't step out. I still remember going back home many years later. I've already become a missionary. I'm even leading a church now in Douala, Cameroon. And I went to our village where I was born. Our village is, is known to be like a, uh, um, it's like a Catholic stronghold. Everything in that village, the hospital, the schools, the orphanages, I mean, the Catholics have developed the village. And so there's a sense of you owe them, you're, you feel indebted. And I remember visiting and meeting the, the sisters, the Catholic sisters, and they're like, what happened to you? I, I, they made me feel like I was lost. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, what, what, I mean, what went wrong? What happened? I mean, they sat me down and interviewed me. It was serious. And so, you, I mean, your comment just reminded me of that. So that, that sense of belonging this is where we belong. And, and so till date, I was really privileged to, um, my dad, when I went back home after many years as a, as a disciple, my dad was very sick. And talking to my dad, met him in the hospital, and I couldn't believe what my dad told me after we had some really intense uh, exchanges then at some point he opened up and told me, you know what? As Catholics, we're not being taught the Bible. Can you please teach me the Bible? I couldn't believe it. Long story short, I started Bible with my dad. He got baptized and he passed on two months later. That was an incredible experience. Okay? Right now till date, my mom respects and loves the church. If, I, if my, my, mom, my mom is still in Cameroon, if there's anything my mom needs, I, I'll just call up brothers back then and they'll take care of her. My mom is traveling to the U.S. to go see two of my brothers. She travels to the main city, stays with disciples. They drop her off at the airport. She's coming back home. They are picking her up from the airport. I mean, she is their mom and they are her children, her sons and daughters. And she loves all of that about the church. The only reason she's not yet a member is what my sister just described. Just that sense of, I was born here, this is where I belong, and this is where I want to stay. So it took a miracle for it to happen for my dad. I don't know what God's going to do for my mom, but I like that comment. Thank you so much. So, some good interaction. Let's move on here. Uh, We've already read, okay, we read the first part. He says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. We're just continuing from where we stopped. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where are the students? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
And then he would go on in chapter 2 to say, when I came to you guys, I resolved that I would know nothing else but Jesus. And precisely, Jesus crucified. He says that in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 1, he moves on into chapter 2. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. And there's a verse where he says, I focus on Jesus, preaching Jesus, and Jesus crucified. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but I, I preach Jesus and Jesus on the cross. And all of this is being said in the context of trying to address the division that was going on that we talked about earlier on. It's in that context. So he's focusing them on Jesus as the unifying factor. Yes, that those who love eloquence and the scholarly stuff, that those who are staunch religious people, the Jews, and then there's those who love the freedom. Yeah, we all have, all have our different biases, and it's important that we're aware of our bias, but our uniting factor is Jesus. And Jesus crucified. Amen? Later on in chapter 3, still within the context of trying to address the issues of division, he says, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants, that's who we are. The focus is on Christ and Christ crucified. We are only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. He's focusing them on Jesus and making themselves and exalting Jesus, which he does, I believe, in all of his letters. So, what are some lessons we can learn from what we just explored together? I believe Jesus and the cross as the answer to division is a big one. Somebody said the cross is a leveler, right? At the foot of the cross, the foot there are not different levels. We're all on the same level. The cross as a leveler. Jesus and the cross is the answer to division. Teamwork. There's a book called Teamwork Makes the Dream Work. So I adapted it and I said, teamwork makes God's dream work. And he talks about the teamwork between him and Apollos. One plan. It is God who makes it grow, right? So we all have our strengths and we all use our strengths that God is ultimately the one who makes it grow. So teamwork, partnership, uh, and an environment where everybody uses their strengths and God is glorified at the end of the day. Lessons. Let's also be aware of our bias or biases, our prejudice. We do have them. We have them in all kinds of eras. We read the Bible with bias. Every scripture, you approach the Bible, we set the information in your mind. And your bias is what you think the Bible is telling you. And it takes removing those biases to finally really hear what God is trying to say. And this applies incredibly in the area of nations, cultures, gathering the nations. We all come with our biases. And we need to acknowledge that we have them. Is it the intellectual bias? Is it the religious bias? Is it freedom? Is it, I mean, we all have our biases. And so let's not go and form sex based on our bias. Jesus is the leveler. Jesus unites us. Amen? And the last point I would just like to make here is let's leverage our global family and our cosmopolitan cities. Let me explain here. Um, like I mentioned about the, er- the, the privilege of heart to live in different countries, I just realized over time, I realized what, 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 what a blessing it is to mix with different cultures. So very often I meet people and they're like, where are you from? Could I try to place me? And at times people have a bit of a challenge placing me because I'm kind of like a mixture of different cultures. And I was thinking, 
Okay, I've had the privilege to travel to different places and interact with different cultures. At home, my mom calls me the Frenchman. Even though I'm, I grew up in an English-speaking family, but because of the influence of living and serving in French-speaking Africa, she calls me the Frenchman. And so I was just thinking about it. I was like, okay, it, it is a huge advantage to have traveled and lived in all these different countries. But I was thinking today, I was like, do I need to necessarily travel to develop that worldview, that open-mindedness that really helps in developing relationships with one another. And I thought, our global family is such a blessing. I'm wearing a t-shirt of the recent Orlando conference where people came from Australia, from New Zealand, from Papua New Guinea, from the ends of the world. But we were thousands and it was like one big family. The day we left the conference, I felt depressed. I was like, oh, this was too good. And then you're coming back to reality. You're like, oh. It's just so good to be, I mean, thousands of disciples. It was just a different environment. Irrespective of color, of culture, that's the blessing we have. And I really believe it, it, it's something we can really tap into to, to develop that sense of global family and unity irrespective of our differences and biases. Uh, and also talking about cosmopolitan cities, I mean, I met Azaya from Zambia, okay? Um, two nights ago, I, I met uh, people from Congo. We had dinner together in Joburg. I, on this trip, I've met people from different nationalities, all gathered. And then we're talking about the Cameroonian guy who's also in the same flight school. So, so we are in a city where we meet people from all kinds of backgrounds. And to be able to leverage that, because it opens our minds and frees us up from so much bias and prejudice and helps us to build God's global plan of gathering the nations. There's a few thoughts I wanted to share and to God be the glory.